Say, has you heard the news? Yeah, I want to tell him. I want to tell him. The news is riveting. Riveting. Absolutely. What the boy? Hello, and welcome to another episode of Barber Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters. Five years ago, my sweaty forehead and I discussed the interesting world of Magnavox's Odyssey 2. There's a link in the description if you want to check it out. But to summarize, the console didn't do all that well here. There are likely several reasons as to why, but one of the biggest problems was the software selection. The bulk of the console's library was created by just a couple of programmers, Sam Overton and Ed Averett. There was virtually no third-party support outside of an iMagic title. Is Philips video pack. TV that you're bezig However, the Odyssey 2's European counterpart, known as the Philips Video Pack, fares slightly better in the market. As such, Parker Brothers, the company that released many of the hottest arcade games of the time to literally anything with a joystick, decided to port over some of its more popular titles. But with hardware specs that could be considered inferior to even the Atari VCS, some sacrifices had to be made. And by some, I mean several. Four games came to the video pack courtesy of Parker Brothers. Frogger, Qbert, Popeye, and Super Cobra. And unlike the entirety of the Odyssey 2 game library, there are no gratuitous exclamation points on any of these titles. So please, keep your voice down when uttering their names. We'll be going quickly over each one of the releases, presented in order from not great to worst in a new segment I'm calling Bad Port Theatre. So without further delay, let's get started. God help us. The strange but simple concept of the Godelieb arcade game Qbert proved successful in 1982. And while the playfield and characters were abstract and colorful, the basic mechanics of jumping from cube to cube to alter its color on a static playfield was easy enough to scale down to most any console. So it's no surprise that the video pack port of Qbert is not the worst thing in the world. The gameplay remains faithful enough to the original, but is certainly not pretty. Even the VFD tabletop version looks better. I know I've seen circles drawn on the Odyssey before, so why are the red and purple balls trapezoidal in this version? While looks certainly aren't everything, Sometimes these graphical deficiencies affect gameplay here. Slick and Sam, who revert your cubes back to their original color, share the same sprite as the green ball. Or in this case, a trapezoid. While it's not fatal to run into any of them, it still throws me off. There were some rounds where it seems the enemies all cold and sick. I had my run of almost the entire pyramid before something finally showed up to threaten my progress. Not sure if that was a glitch or a feature. There's certainly plenty to nitpick about here. The presence of multiple purple eggs at once, Qbert's sprite looking like a potato man lounging on the sofa, the random bleeps, bloops, and harsh noise in place of recognizable sounds and melodies. But honestly, it's the most playable of the bunch in this list. The 1981's Frogger is another one of those simple concepts that proved wildly popular in the arcades. And like Hubert, the game design is uncomplicated enough to port to almost anything. And indeed, the video pack version starts off strong, opening with a title screen and familiar jingle. But that's pretty much all the tricks it has up its sleeve. The console could only handle so much before it catches fire. This is why the playfield is split into two separate screens. It's like Frogger 2, three deep, but instead, two deep. Splitting the playfield into two screens is more of a curious oddity. The game's more severe flaw is the dodgy hit detection. I've met my demise through jumps I could have sworn were safe, got killed by the edge of the screen when I swore I had more time, even jumped over the Lady Frog when such a feat should not be possible. And damned if this isn't the most difficult port of Frogger I've ever played. In addition to the collision detection issues, the logs and turtles align safely at less frequent intervals. The window for hitting certain home squares, especially the leftmost one, is narrower than other versions, including the arcade original. Still, it's not horrible. Like Hubert, it's playable. But also like Hubert, if I had to choose between the video pack version and its VFD tabletop counterpart, I would almost certainly choose the latter.
Super Cobra was Stern's 1981 sequel to Scramble. It proved to be just as popular and just as challenging. But you know what we take for granted? Scrolling. Seriously. It seems like something computer chips just do naturally, like solving complex calculations and dreaming of electric sheep. But it's not so easy for prehistoric hardware with crippling memory limitations to seamlessly move the playfield in semi-real time. Even the NES had issues with it at the beginning, often limiting scrolling to one direction and incorporating a noticeable delay during vertical screen transitions. Obviously the video pack slash Odyssey 2 was struggle with scrolling. So how does a fast-paced, horizontally scrolling shooter like Super Cobra work with a console that lacks scrolling? Simple. It doesn't. You fly your helicopter across the screen, trying to destroy whatever is a threat. If you can't hit them with your bombs or gun, try to avoid the hostile fire. Your Whirlybird has two speeds. Slow, and still slow, but with the illusion of haste. Which means, sorry, you're getting hit. Make it to the edge of the screen, and it will leisurely load up a new section while your copter waits patiently wherever it currently is. Seems they knew that damage was nigh unavoidable in this port, which is why they gave you a single copter with a health meter instead of individual lives. It's a duct tape solution, to say the least. Kudos to the programmers for somewhat effectively mapping fire and bombs to the same single button based on how long you hold it. But too bad they saw fit to limit your number of bombs per screen, when it's all too easy to discharge them accidentally. I feel like the video pack version of Super Cobra may have been more enjoyable, or at least slightly more charming, were it detached from the name and license of the arcade original. Funny game, that Popeye. Nintendo, at first, couldn't get the license to make a Popeye game, so they made Donkey Kong instead. But with rights eventually obtained, Nintendo went ahead and made that Popeye game in 1982, with a unique spin on the Collect All the MacGuffins style of gameplay. While not as groundbreaking as Donkey Kong, it was still a decent hit in the arcades. And as such, it was soon ported to all the home consoles and computers at the time. While the faithfulness to the original varies wildly depending on hardware specs, they were all recognizable in style and gameplay. All except the video pack version. I mean, did they program this port based on the vague description of Popeye? I don't even know where to start. As a reminder, this is what it should look like. Granted, I know it won't be as detailed, but it would seem some harsh hardware limitations have forced them to replace the convenient staircases with division symbols. I am guessing that Brutus and other interactive objects like stairwells and the spinach, which is now located at the bottom, have to be kept mutually exclusive from each other on the same scan lines. This is why you'll never see him on the bottom row. Oh wait, look! A circle! See? It's possible. Speaking of Brutus, what is he even doing in this version of the game besides preventing convenient ingress and egress between floors? I had to crank the skill level up before he even started moving. And even when he does, it's never with any purpose. He'll walk around, hoping for a chance encounter with Popeye. Maybe he'll jump, or spit down a level. But that's it. Also, why is he like 10 times larger than Popeye? He's not some giant fresh off the beanstalk or vegetable can in the cartooning comics. I wonder if a lot of the technical issues could have been prevented if they resisted the urge to make Brutus hilariously humongous. It goes without saying that there's very little challenge in this version of Popeye especially with no sea hags to hurl bottles at you and Brutus banned from large parts of the level. Matter of fact, one of the biggest threats to Popeye is standing in the wrong spot when Brutus recovers from the spinach attack. The other is letting a heart drown. And if that happens, Olive Oil will be so upset she'll vomit all over your sailor shoes. Oh, and I hope you like the first round of Popeye, because that's all you get in the video pack version, collecting hearts until you finally get fed up with Olive's endless test of your affection. This version of Popeye is good for a laugh, but also extraordinarily bad. That's it for the official releases, but surprisingly there's more. Parker Brothers developed two additional games that were never officially released. The first is Spider-Man, which appears to be a port of the Atari 2600 version. 
And while it makes the jump seemingly well, for better or worse, gameplay issues that may have been forgivable on the VCS are amplified by the sluggish animation. Even dying oftentimes takes forever. The other game is a port of the arcade game to Tankum. I was never too keen on the game in the arcade, with the characters shooting limited only to the x-axis. But the video pack version is further crippled with a lack of scrolling, inconsistent walking speed, and what seems like an unwinnable maze design. Of course, these games were unreleased. It's possible the end result could have been different had it hit the shelves of their local Dixons. But then again, probably not. At any rate, those were the Parker Brothers games of the Philips video pack. My sympathy to European owners who were left disappointed by ports that fell several meters short of expectations. I'm not entirely sure which deficiencies were due to hardware that was lacking, and which were simply programmer apathy. But I'll tell you what. As fun as it is to see how old consoles attempted to replicate popular arcade games for the home market, I'm certainly glad we live in an age where hardware limitations are not really much of an issue. We can now enjoy these originals at home with none of the sacrifices we had to endure back in the day. What an age we live in. This was Dave for TV Games. Thanks for watching. One thing I hate sets a pushy announcement. <laughs>